Uh, right. So hopefully you can all see me okay. Cool. Uh, yes. Just to share my screen. Okay. Okay, um, hello everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Matt Keir, Um and I started around about this time last year working on autonomous auto rotation for the Google Summer of Code. Um, so this is basically a, a summary of the work that I've done as part of that project and the, the work I've carried on doing um, beyond that period. Uh, so I'm relatively new to the uh, community, so I thought I'd take this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, my background to introduce myself properly. Uh, then I'll launch into the actual presentation and kind of talk about uh, the auto rotation. You know, what is it? Why do we use it? And a little bit of the physics that underlies that problem. Then I'll talk about the entry and glide controller, the flare controller, and the touchdown controller. So that's how I've broken the problem down and how I've set up all of the controllers. And then I'll finish off with talking about uh, what what the future problems are and what needs to still be done. So um, I was originally uh, sort of trained as an aerospace engineer uh, and I uh, worked at uh, Leonardo Helicopters. I started on their graduate program um, and moved through a few different departments, uh, structural dynamics, rotor aerodynamics, rotor stress, uh, just to name a few. Uh, I had the pleasure to work on two aircraft that you can see on the screen. So the AW101 and the AW609 tilt rotor. Um, after a little while, I decided I wanted to return to academia to, uh, to study my engineering doctorate. So I returned to Swansea University in the UK uh, to uh, sort of start looking at the prediction of noise produced by restrictions in pipes uh, using numerical methods such as computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis. And that's kind of what I'm doing at the moment. I'm in the final year of my doctorate, uh, just trying to finish that up. Where that fits in with the story is that this is where I met Peter Hall. Um, and Peter and I set up a team of students um, to enter into the Institute of Mechanical Engineers UAS competition. So the aircraft you can see that we designed is the image on the bottom. And you can see our competition run in the uh, sort of left middle video and then the actual team on competition day in the top right hand corner. So that was um, sort of like my first contact with RG Pilot um, and basically it's what gave me the bug. Um, and so both Peter and I kept messing around and we would start just making any and all kinds of vehicles um, that we could basically just trying to learn more about it and having fun whilst we were doing it. Um, we ended up, we've enjoyed it so much that um, we ended up, uh, we've recently, very recently set up our own consultancy, KH and MAND, uh, where we provide support with in a wide range of areas. So it can be anything from RG pilot coding, uh, it can be design work, it can be sort of numerical analysis, CFD, FEA, that kind of thing. Uh, vehicle tuning, uh, that's just to name out a few of the different things that we've gotten involved with so far. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a feel for you know who I am uh, and you know what I've done in the past. Um, so just before I uh, launch into the rest of the presentation, uh, I appreciate that you know everyone's got very different backgrounds and they might not uh, have actually come into contact with traditional helicopters yet. So um, I just wanted to cover a couple of key terms that I'm going to be using just to make sure everyone's you know, working off the same base. Uh, so the main kind of control system uh, and the main rotor head is a swash plate, uh, as you can see from, uh, from the video. Now the, this, the swash plate is used for translating the controls from the fixed body frame to the rotating head frame. Uh, what you can see is, or this swash plate that is shown is known as a CPPM, which is a cyclic collective pitch mixing swash plate. And it's a very common one that's used in radio control aircraft now, uh, but there are different types of swash plates available. Then we have collective, which is a type of motion uh, of the swash plate. And this is the translation up and down the main rotor shaft. This symmetrically increases and decreases the blade pitch. And it's, it's synonymous with uh, increasing your thrust output on a multi-rotor, for example, your throttle output, I should say. Then we have cyclic. So cyclic controls the blade angle dependent on the azimuth position. So there's the little image in the bottom left which shows what I mean by azimuth angle. And you can see that the swash plate was rolling and now is in pitch. And this sort of changes that uh, blade pitch um, and 
gives us uh, sort of control moments about the airframe. Finally, we've got disk loading. So disk loading is uh, very much like wing loading with fixed wing aircraft. Uh, I would kind of describe it as how floaty a helicopter is or how hard it needs to work to fly. Um, where, so the, the sort of general formulation of it is the uh, thrust divided by the rotor disc area with the rotor disc area indicated in the image. Uh, where I'm using it throughout this presentation, I'm typically referring, I'm trying to compare to different aircraft. And so I'm using uh, the hover case. So that's always going to be weight over disc area. So that's just a, a point moving forward. So the auto rotation itself, it's, uh, what is it? It's the helicopter equivalent of a glide is the best way I can put it. It's typically used as an emergency maneuver uh, whereby there's no torque supplied by the engine. So you can see um, from the powered flight uh, velocity vector and uh, load vector on the blade, uh, you can see we've got engine torque here. That engine torque is counteracting our lift, or the component of lift and the component of drag that are in our horizontal or our rotating disc plane. When it comes to the auto rotation, we don't have that torque. So the aircraft is constantly descending. So you have this descent velocity here, which increases that angle of attack. Um, Increasing that angle of attack um, then rotates our lift vector forward. So the, so the in-plane lift component is what counteracts that blade drag and drives the, um, it continues to drive the main rotor. So to give a little bit of an overview of how I've broken down, broken down the problem, um, I thought I would sort of split out the different sections as I've split out the, the logic in the actual controller. So you can imagine our aircraft is flying merrily along you know, in straight level, unaccelerated flight. All of a sudden, cough, cough, splutter, splutter, the aircraft engine dies. So the first of immediate actions is to make sure that our helicopter can continue to fly. So to do that, you lower the collective, uh, that helps to maintain a healthy head speed, and you start, to, you either maintain or you need to build airspeed to keep a safe flight. This then takes you into the glide phase. So this is essentially where you're just maintaining that good head speed and you're maintaining that airspeed or continuing to build it if you need to. And depending on whether the height allows, this is where you have the opportunity to perform some navigation, looking for your best landing spot. Now this can be uh, either um, turning into wind or it can be just finding a little bit more area around you to land in. As you approach the ground, you're looking to flare. Now the flare in a helicopter is synonymous with the flare with a fixed wing. You're essentially turning your forward airspeed into lift. Now with helis, there's the additional component of head speed. As you uh, flare, the, the uh, lift vector wants to increase that rotational speed uh, in the head. So uh, typically you're gonna manage that with collective to maintain a sensible head speed. You don't want to go into an overspeed condition. As you talk, uh, reach the, the end of the flare, you're looking to have lower air speed and you're close to the ground. So you're going to use what uh, energy you have stored in the head and uh, just to uh, sort of finesse that landing, just applying collective gently. I know that I should say that there are other breaks that breakdowns to um, the sort of auto rotation and the different phases of it, depending on what literature you're reading. Uh, I just say that this is how I approached the problem, and this is, this is essentially my breakdown. So to give a better uh, overview of you know what the aircraft looked like in in the real, um, I've got this video from the Hungarian police practicing auto rotations. So you can see the aircraft coming in. This is currently on the glide in the auto rotation. And there's a reasonable glide out of glide ratio there. As the aircraft approaches the ground, they start to raise the nose for the flare, which slows the descent speed, adopting that landing attitude for the touchdown. Now you'll notice that they've a touchdown with significant forward airspeed still. So you can have a ground run if your landing area permits. So now I'm going to break down each of the different parts of the physics uh, and sort of talk a little bit about the loads that you'd expect to see in these different phases. So I've made these uh, little animations, which will uh, hopefully help to illustrate what's going on. Okay. 
So in this example, the conditions are going into it. So it's entry from straight level on accelerated flight. And this is effectively the, the, the perfect auto rotation in the fact that we can have no loss and no change in head speed at all. So the key thing to note is that our vertical velocity component in powered flight is coming in through the top of the main rotor head. Then as the aircraft begins to descend, you get this flow reversal and that flow reversal is what then starts to drive our angle of attack or, or is, is, will attempt to increase our angle of attack. We manage that by lowering this blade collective. And in the process of doing that, you can see that our lift vector starts to tilt forward. And that's what gives us the driving force uh, to replace the torque that's no longer provided by the engine. Finally, what we can see is that our overall thrust vector is reducing and that's what contributes to that descent rate. And eventually you get all of, uh, you know, a nice balance of all these forces, and that's where you can get into your steady state glide. And so typically when things are balanced out, this is roughly what the forces look like. So in the glide, you're just managing your head speed using collective. So you're looking to uh, also then manage your forward airspeed or continue to build forward airspeed, say you've initiated from a hover case and you're just maintaining your airspeed with attitude which is controlled through cyclic and if height permits you can maneuver towards your best landing area as i previously mentioned looking to turn into wind if possible reducing that ground speed on landing uh, just a, a comment here that um, there's actually a cross coupling in controls so uh, as you change collective, that actually changes the uh, pitch moments about the aircraft. So for example, if you lower the collective, the nose of the vehicle will naturally want to drop. So there is this cross coupling that can be seen and the controller needs to handle um, to some extent. So I'll, I'll touch on that again later. So the flare in more detail. So back with our friends in the Hungarian police force in slow motion. You can see as the vehicle is approaching the ground, we're raising the nose. The idea here is to generate more lift, slow that descent speed and reduce the forward airspeed. What that looks like in terms of the, the forces. So this is for the instantaneous uh, moment as you start to pitch the vehicle. You'll notice that, uh, so we're gonna maintain the same collective position and we're pitching the vehicle, which is increasing this descent or this vertical velocity component. Doing so is increasing that angle of attack, which is significantly increasing our lift vector. That has two effects. Um, the lift vector is both tilting forward and increasing. So in this example, it will want to drive the, um, the head. It'll want to speed it up. Now this is great if you're going in in a, a slightly low head speed condition, the flare is the perfect opportunity to really recover some of that energy into the head ready for your touchdown. The other thing to note, of course, is that this increase in lift also sees an increase in the thrust vector, which is what is ultimately going to subsequently reduce this vertical velocity component and reduce our forward velocity component. So once we've flared, we're looking to move into the touchdown. Now, in my opinion, the, the best way to have a good touchdown is to have a good flare. That being said, um, you know, or sort of, sorry, you can touch down with uh, or without some forward airspeed, and that's dependent on your landing area. Typically, it's safer to touch down with some forward airspeed. Forward air, you know, airspeed is your friend at the end of the day, uh, but this is obviously landing area dependent. Now, we've already seen the Hungarian police force, and they're touching down with some forward airspeed. So, just as uh, to, to offer the counterpoint, uh, this is an example on the bottom right hand of a spot auto rotation. So you can see that both are perfectly feasible and fundamentally it's your landing area which is what's going to drive your decision on this. In the touchdown phase your descent speed can be managed uh, and you're going to continue to manage that with whatever, whatever energy you have that's stored in your head. Uh, the difficulty here is that you know there is a minimum head speed that you can go to before you start really losing control authority so you can only use a certain percentage of whatever energy you stored in the head uh, so th th this is this can only be done uh, to a certain extent. 
And of course, the, some of the critical things is you've got to make sure your wings level and watch that tail boom. You don't want to have a tail strike on landing. And typically, your vehicle should be constantly descending. Uh, you're not looking to come to a stop or perform a hover or anything like that before landing. The, you, know, you want to try and achieve your, your descent rate at the end of your flare and maintain that descent rate until you touch down. So to give you a feeling for that, if you're looking at uh, NED frame, the vertical velocity should be in the, in the order of 0.5 meters per second for a nice soft touchdown. So that gives uh, an overview of kind of the underlying physics and hopefully you get a little bit more of a feel for what's going on with um, the, the actual auto rotation and how it works. So now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the actual controllers that I've developed that allow us to do this autonomously. So the entry and glide controller is actually the same thing. Um, one is just a subset of another. So there are two controllers currently working. We've got the head speed controller and the forward speed controller. So the head speed controller is very simple. It's got, you know, you have a, a set point which is set by operators using, the, using a parameter. We determine the error of uh, that head speed and apply a P gain. Uh, this gets passed through to the collective control, which is in the motors library. Uh, and this is what affects our, uh, ultimately affects our head speed. So, you know, we would reduce our collective to increase head speed, increase our collective to reduce head speed. And uh, then we've got this low pass filter here. Um, so this is uh, what's termed as a following trim. So basically, instead of our P gain always acting about uh, a zero, uh, it actually acts about a moving point. And so we've got this trim, which is enacted through this filter. Now I tried a couple of different things, uh, namely, so like a, you know, I've tried like a PI controller as well, uh, as well as PIDs. Uh, and this is generally what I found works the best. And I must say that, so this is Bill Guy's idea to, uh, to have the following trim. Uh, and it works brilliantly. Um, and uh, I'm a huge fan of doing uh, taking this approach. So additionally, uh, what I've in, uh, incorporated into this is, um, well, we already had the health monitoring on RPM sensors. So I just used that so that um, with a what if condition. So if we have a poor sensor health, uh, the controller automatically lowers the collective to uh, the HCOL mins, uh, the, 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 the collective minimum setting. And it's not ideal. The aircraft is going to descend at a higher rate. However, you will guaranteed to you are guaranteed to maintain a safe head speed, given that you haven't got that feedback loop anymore. Um, now, the entry is just a subset of the glide in that it actually just uses a higher cutoff frequency in this low pass filter. What this allows us to do is it, essentially, when you initiate the auto rotation, it moves that sort of collective trim quicker to get you to a ballpark right figure. And then when you've got when you're in the glide phase, you reduce that cutoff frequency just for the fine tuning of that trim position. The forward speed controller. So again, set point through a parameter. You're giving a target value, and then this is um, the, the velocity is an acceleration limited. You know, making sure that the vehicle isn't going to have too aggressive a pitch applied uh, to try and increase that speed. Uh, so that's passed through, well, we determine the error, passed through a P gain, and we've got the uh, a feed forward term as well. These ultimately convert our velocity target into an acceleration target. That acceleration is then converted to a pitch value by taking the uh, tangent of the ratio from the um, vertical acceleration, gravity, to the target forward acceleration. That's then passed to the lovely attitude controller, um, and it deals with it from there. Um, so we end up measuring our forward speed as a result. So something I should mention here is that currently in Copter, forward speed is calculated in NED from the GPS. Um, in particular, in this case, it's not particularly useful. Or it's, um, it's, it's a criticality that we need to introduce uh, airspeed support or airspeed indicators into Copter. This will make um, this controller significantly more robust. So by not doing this, effectively what happens is if you're flying into wind, uh, the vehicle is going to try much, much harder to try and go forward. In doing so, uh, the, you, you lower the nose significantly more. You end up having a m much worse glide ratio. and um, it, it's uh, generally when I've tried this in the sim, it, it really struggles against wind. So this kind of brings us to the end of uh, the uh, Google Summer of Code period.
of last year. So I spent a lot of my time doing this all the development in Real Flight 8. I really wouldn't be able to do this without, um, without that simulator. Um, so the, the original video, which kind of gives a summary of what I did in that project, is uh, the link is here. Uh, but this video shows um, basically that work. So the aircraft is entering into the auto rotation from a hover. You can see that the aircraft has lowered the nose, trying to build that airspeed to get a safe flying speed. And then the head speed controller is maintaining or first recovers the head speed and maintains, the head, um, maintains it throughout the glide. Now, something I haven't really talked about much at the moment is navigation options. So the navigation options currently are quite limited and essentially they're just for uh, operators to, to, to work with. So uh, you, the operators still have uh, role and your control. So using small amounts of those control, we can maneuver the aircraft in the right direction. But that is a future development that, you know, there's going to be autonomous navigation added into this. Um, I've also tried to do a little bit of real world testing with some mixed results. So uh, you can see an image of my uh, little 450 helicopter that I took out to, um, to, to test this. And um, uh, so I would show you a video of it, but unfortunately, it's just basically watching a little black pixel move on a screen. So it's not that informative. But the, the link to the full video is, is here if you are interested in seeing it. Essentially, what happens is uh, after entering into the auto rotation mode, um, looking back on the logs, you can see that the head speed controller works as expected and the forward air speed controller works as expected. And so the vehicle starts building air, um, building air speed and managing its head speed. The problem is because I didn't have the remainder of the controllers built in, it couldn't just perform a full auto rotation. So I had to have some form of bailout function. Now, that's something I haven't really talked about and don't talk about much in this presentation, but there is an additional phase and that's the bailout phase. Now, what happened in this test was that the, um, the bailout phase didn't work quite as I'd planned. Uh, and so that's where this test kind of failed in that the aircraft didn't manage to recover itself properly. It actually resulted in a complete blade stop and the helicopter started basically plummeting out of the sky. It did get its stuff together in the end um, and the head did spin up and managed to give enough control to keep the aircraft upright. Um, upon landing, so it just had a heavy landing which crushed the landing gear. Uh, so the, the vehicle uh, you know, largely survived and, and it has flown again since, so it wasn't a complete failure. But what was positive was the fact that the, um, the, the two primary controllers that I was developing, the head speed and the forward speed controllers, were working. So since the Google Summer of Code, um, I've spent a significant amount of effort working on the flare phase. Um, so I'm going to talk you through kind of the uh, approach and the thought process and just kind of the, the, the storyline as to how I got to where I've gotten with the flare controller. So to do that, I just want to, to introduce a couple of terms. Um, so what, what I've shown you here is uh, the forces in the earth frame. Uh, so we've got uh, the Z, which is our generated vertical forces. Uh, that's sort of counteracted by the weight of the vehicle. And we've got F, which is our forward generated fo forces, and that's counteracted by drag. And then the delta Z and the delta F show the resultant forces in the respective axes. Now it's very convenient for us to just mass normalize these values um, so that it becomes less specific to the vehicle and doesn't require knowledge of the vehicle mass. Noting again, of course, that these are all in earth frame. Uh, and just a couple of points is that uh, typically uh, what I'm doing is that the, the double over dot represents a uh, second derivative in time. So it's, um, that's an acceleration in the Z axis and the forward axis. So to start kind of characterizing the flare phase, what I started doing was I was flying in real flight eight, just um, flying a number of auto rotations. And I kept a notepad and pen with me and I was essentially just scoring my auto rotations as I was flying them. You know, is that a good one? Yeah, is it a bad one? Ooh, I don't like that. So I would just kind of mar mark down what I thought was good. I then filtered out all the ones that I thought were good and I overlaid them on top of each other. And that's what you can see here. So this, this is the, the, the resultant vertical acceleration. So gravity has been removed. Now the advantage of the sim is that um, you get much cleaner data out. You don't have that noisy vibrating envi environment. Um, and so you get these much cleaner data streams. So the trend becomes a little bit more apparent. You can then see the vertical velocity up here and then the height above home here. So if we take the mean and then remove the remaining test data, the trend starts to become a little bit more apparent. A couple of comments here in that this initial offset and acceleration is because, well, I was basically flying it imperfectly. 
I wasn't um, coming in and flying, okay, this is going to be my flare. I was, as I was getting close to the ground, I was sort of unknowingly in quite a few of those auto rotations, just raising that nose a little bit earlier. So that's what's introducing this um, resultant acceleration here. And that sort of offset of acceleration is what creates that gradient, the initial gradient that we see in the velocity. So I tried to characterize the acceleration uh, and I did that by using this equation. Now, what was quite interesting to me was that um, uh, after watching Leonard talk yesterday is that in fact, this is the same equation that Leonard uses for the jerk controller. Um, and I was completely unaware of that. So it's, um, it's some, some nice symmetry there. So the blue line shows this, this equation um, compared to the test data. And um, the, the key things to note here is so that you only need two values to tune this. So you've got the peak acceleration, which is this point here, and you've got the time period, which is you know, the time period from the start to the end of the flare. So this has a number of advantages. Something I've already touched on is the fact that there's only two variables here that really need to be used to tune this, um, this trajectory, and that's the peak acceleration and the flare time period. Uh, it's a continuous function um, and with a continuous high derivative. So you know, it doesn't matter how many time you uh, take derivatives of this, the, you, know, you jerk, you snap, crackle, pop, that they're all going to be continuous. So you're not going to get any nasty um, sort of discontinuities in your controller. Um, integrating your acceleration then yields your velocity and, or target velocity and position targets. Um, and this gives us the ability to look forward in time as to where we think the, the aircraft needs to be. And this gives us the ability to decide when the aircraft needs to flare. So performing those integrations gives us this equation for the vertical velocity, this equation for the vertical position. Now, you don't need to digest those equations so much. Um, the key thing to note here is that integration does yield some constants that need to be added uh, or some boundary conditions. And so we've got this uh, Z dot zero, which is our initial vertical velocity. So this is the vertical velocity at the point that we start flaring. And then we've got the initial vertical position. So that's the you know, measured at the point that we start the flare. So these come from the EKF. Now, comparing these two equations to the test data, I hope you'd agree that there's a pretty good match to uh, the test data. So this dashed black line is the, is the mean from our test previously. And we already talked about um, the fact that this gradient was here due to my sort of mishandling uh, of the, uh, the auto rotations earlier on. But the general trend seems very, you know, very promising. Um, and then when we look at the height of home, it looks even better again. And so there's a really good match between the two here. Um, and um, it depends, well, something I found very interesting, I suppose it depends uh, if you're mathematically inclined or excited by this stuff like I am or not, is the fact that um, the error actually reduces each time you take a, an order of magnitude each time you take an integration. Um, so this is why we're seeing such a low error um, when it comes to our uh, altitude position target. So that's the vertical axes. Uh, I'll now talk a little bit about the forward axes. Now, um, unfortunately, this isn't, wasn't quite as simple to do because the sort of the resultant forward acceleration, you can't, uh, the, it's, um, uh, it's, it's hindered by drag. Drag itself is a function of velocity. So what this ends up giving us is a, um, a second order system of partial differential equations. And the only way to really solve that is iteratively. Now, Having an iterative solver in a um, uh, real-time flight controller is just well, not suitable and neither is it sensible. So I needed to come up with some way to account for the drag without having to do this iteration. So this is kind of the process that I went through in kind of getting to uh, where we are today. So as a comparison, we've got the generated forward acceleration on the left, and then this is the resultant vertical acceleration that we were looking at previously. So again, we've got the test data and then the mean of that test data. Removing the test data again shows the trend. And something to note was that the peak acceleration in both the forward axes and the vertical axes were at roughly the same time at the half period of the flare. Um, and the other thing to note is that the, the general shape was smooth and it may be a bit of a stretch, but it looked a little bit like a cosine relationship. 
Um, and the, the, sorry, the, the, this, this peak, uh, the timing of the peak um, also indicates that both axes are acting in phase. There's no offset between the two. So, you know, with these observations, I thought, well, it's worth a go, isn't it? Um, let's, uh, let, let's see if um, it's a reasonable assumption to just say that our sort of resultant forward uh, acceleration is going to be of the exact same form as our vertical. So the next stage then is we need to determine an approximation for the drag acceleration, and then we can reconstruct the total uh, forward acceleration that we need. So a couple of assumptions in that is that um, we make a flat disc or a rigid head assumption. Um, now, for a lot of the vehicles that are operating RG Pilot, this is reasonable because um, most are using, or there are a lot of vehicles, I should say, using 3D capable helis, which have very stiff, very rigid heads, um, which you know, this assumption holds for. Uh, where this starts to fall down a little bit is where uh, some of the more sort of heavy use case uh, UAV applications with fully articulated heads or uh, even teetering rotor heads. So there's going to be, need to be some adaptation in the future to kind of remove this assumption. And then the other part of this is that uh, our resultant force acts orthogonal to our main rotor head. And this is uh, exactly like is done in uh, multi-rotors. So um, essentially what, we, what I try to do here is I approximate the drag as a, what's known as an initial value problem. So if you recall, we're doing, dealing with everything's mass normalized. So this is a drag acceleration. Um, and all of these values to compute this drag are all measurable from the uh, altitude heading reference system. So this is the uh, vertical acceleration at the point of flare initiation. Uh, this is the pitch angle at the point of flare initiation. Uh, and then this is the resultant uh, forward acceleration, again, at the point of initiation. So all of this is measurable and effectively what we're looking for is we're just trying to find out how much of this resultant component is acting in the forward plane and we're saying that you know this is what our current drag acceleration is going to be. We then need to offset or be able to kind of change this um, as we move through in time and as our velocity varies and we know that uh, from dimensional analysis that drag does vary with the square of velocity. We also know that drag must be zero when the velocity is zero. So armed with this, then we can use this very simple scaling relationship whereby essentially we're scaling our initial drag value uh, by the measured velocity versus the velocity of the initial part of that flare. And what this does is this gives us a function of dra or drag as a function of both time and forward velocity. And we get a relationship which looks like this. And this is just like what we would typically see for um, a drag velocity relationship uh, if we were to measure it from experimentation. So this seems very promising. So the next thing to do is to sort of apply that to uh, the sort of resultant uh, cosine relationship and see what we get. And this is what this graph shows. So the, the dashed red line is the, the, the cosine relationship and then we're adding on our drag. Um, so what we can see is that uh, at the point of flare initiation, we've initially got some positive forward acceleration. This makes sense. You know, we want the aircraft to be pitched nose down so that it's, um, it, it's counteracting uh, the drag to give us some forward airspeed. We note that as time goes on and we move through that flare, the margin between the two is reducing, i.e. our drag is reducing as our forward airspeed is reducing. Now, in this case, the aircraft is coming to a forward airspeed of zero. So at the point of zero, our resultant, uh, or sorry, our total generated forward acceleration also drops to zero. So this, you know, I start seeing this and I think, okay, this is looking promising. This, this might be very useful. So at the moment, we've got two acceleration profiles. We've got one in the vertical um, and we've got um, one in the horizontal or forward. Um, comparing the, the, the forward to the um, uh, the test data it wasn't as easy to overlay the data as previous so i kind of just um, did a, a rough comparison to see that you know, we we can see that our acceleration initially is greater than uh, when we finish which is true for um, the test data and we can see we've got this apparent cosine relationship but unfortunately at this point that's pretty much um, all i was able to, um, to, to to perform a comparison with at this point so the only thing to do is really to basically plug it all in and uh, see if this works. 
So now that we have these two orthogonal axes, it's okay, how are we going to use this? Um, and so effectively, we just combine them uh, into a coupled controller. So with the two orthogonal axes, we can use Pythagoras theorem to um, come out with the resultant acceleration that we expect to see orthogonal to the disk plane. And we can come out with our pitch angle target theta. Now, um, at this point, I started getting quite excited and quite uh, hopeful that this was going to work. Now, the key or the interesting thing to me at this point was the, 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 was the, the, the pitch angle. You note that we've got a negative pitch angle uh, predicted initially. So that's a nose down pitch angle, which makes sense because we're trying to drive the vehicle forward. Then as we enter into the flare, the nose raises, which is exactly what we want to see. The nose raises to a maximum um, pitch angle and then starts to reduce back to zero. So, you know, we're already automatically adopting that suitable landing attitude to come into the touchdown phase. So when I started seeing this, I thought, okay, right, this is promising. This, this, is, this, is, what's, um, uh, this is what we needed. So I've thrown quite a few like equations and a bit of math around. Um, and one of the, so I thought the best way to kind of visualize this is just through an animation of that flare phase. So applying all those sort of accelerations, um, uh, into this animation, you can see this is the behavior that our target trajectory is telling our vehicle to do. Now, I think that looks remarkably similar to uh, what the, uh, the Hungarian police video looked like. The only difference here is that the vehicle isn't touching down with forward airspeed, it's coming to a complete stop. Now, some of the things to note is the fact that you've got this drag acceleration here, which starts to reduce as the vehicle slows its forward airspeed. We've got our peak acceleration here, and then those accelerations start to decay until the point that our sort of resultant just matches weight at the point that the vehicle touches down. So with all this information with the target trajectory, we're now able to apply a closed loop acceleration controller for both the pitch angle um, and the accelerations that are resultant um, in the disc plane. So that this is what we'd control with our collective. We can adjust that, um, so those acceleration trajectories by using errors in position and velocity. So this is much like how the position controller works. Um, and it allows us to have a, quite a robust controller in the sense that you know we can make sure that the vehicle is where we want it to be and flying at the condition in the states that we want it to be and we've got this a great advantage now as well that we've got this look forward so provided that we've tuned our trajectory to make sure that it's um, uh, it's physically possible for the aircraft to fly the trajectory we requested we can now look forward to where it's likely to be and all of this is defined using just five variables. So we, we, you know, we, we can say what we want the peak acceleration to be um, at the point you know, for the resultant acceleration. We can say how, what flare time period we want um, the, the maneuver to be performed over. So light disc loaded aircraft, such as uh, 3D capable aircraft, uh, they're going to be um, uh, like, they're gonna use lower fly, flare time periods and heavy UAV based um, higher disc loading aircraft are gonna have a, a longer flare time period. Then we define what altitude we want to exit that, uh, that, um, uh, that flare at, and the other exit conditions are forward and vertical velocities. So we can touch down with some forward airspeed or not. So I wanted to talk about kind of that decision-making process in the controller for, you know, when is the aircraft going to initiate the flare? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to determine what the peak vertical and forward accelerations are going to be. Now, because we know the trajectory and we know that the acceleration occurs at half of the, uh, the flare time period, our equations actually rearrange and simplify to be this. Now, uh, this is a parameter value, which is the desired touchdown Z velocity, and this is the desired touchdown forward velocity. Z.0 and F.0 are measured at the points that we're sort of checking. You know, if I flare here, this is what my velocity and velocities are going to be. And the T is our flare time period. So all these values are known. We can approximate the drag in this initial condition, as we discussed previously. And then we want to look forward and project that drag to the point at which we're going to ex experience the peak acceleration. Um, so to do that, we just need to evaluate what our velocity is going to be at the half flare period time. So we've just calculated this here. Um, this is a parameter value 
and this is measured. So again, we can do that. We can get a reasonable approximation to what our velocity is going to be. So this allows us to correct our drag so that we can evaluate it at the point of peak acceleration. Now what the, this gives us the ability to is actually calculate, this is our peak resultant acceleration by accounting for drag, sorry, drag and gravity. And then this is our maximum pitch angle that we're expecting to see. This gives us something to compare against. So we can set these as parameters, as limits. We can say, you know, my vehicle cannot produce more acceleration than this. My I don't want my vehicle to be pitching beyond this. So this gives us a check to say, you know, am I going to flare now? No, I don't quite meet these criteria. I'm not going to flare. If we do meet the criteria, the next thing is to look forward and find out, okay, what is my altitude going to be at the end of the flare maneuver? And that's what this rearrange equation tells us. Again, all these values are known or measurable. So we look forward, what's our altitude going to be? We compare that against um, the parameter value for our desired touchdown altitude, and provided we're within some acceptable threshold, then we can enter the flare. So this is a kind of system diagram of what the flare controller has ultimately ended up looking like. Um, I really wanted to try and keep this as um, uh, neat as possible in, you know, to try and like uh, convey what's going on in the control. And I apologize because it has ended up coming out a little bit more complicated than I wanted. But some of the key things to note are, so the blue values are the target values. And these come from the, this cosine trajectory that we've already defined. The green values are the measured values that come straight out of the EKF. And we start off with, we input our altitude target. From the altitude error, we apply the P gain, and that allows us to correct our vertical velocity target. The corrected vertical velocity target is compared against the measurements to give us a velocity error. That passed through another P gain, and then allows us to correct our vertical acceleration target based on any errors of velocity and altitude. Similarly, um, well, we, we don't actually monitor the forward position of the vehicle. We start out that we care about the forward velocity. So we give a velocity target, we determine what that error is, apply a P gain so that allows us to correct our uh, forward acceleration target. So we then have our two acceleration uh, targets that are orthogonal to each other. And this is where the, the cross coupling comes in. And so uh, we apply both of these to convert into our resultant target and our uh, pitch target. And then this allows us to pass through uh, our, an, an error into a P gain. And as we uh, feed into the collective controller and the attitude controller, I've opted to use these low pass following trip, low pass cutoff filter following trims again. Now, uh, that's a general overview of what the controller looks like. Um, this is changing a little bit here and there because, you know, this is all still in development, but this is the current state of uh, how it's working. So then uh, that moves then from the flare into the touchdown. Now, the touchdown controller is actually just an extension of the flare controller with a couple of additional limits that are applied. So um, there's one of two conditions in which we step into the touchdown phase. Either uh, we sort of reach the end of that flare time period, so that timer has elapsed. This is the great condition. This is what we want. This is everything is working smoothly. Uh, the other is we approach our touchdown altitude or altitude too quickly. So once, as soon as we achieve that altitude, we need to apply some conditions very quickly. Uh, so that um, we've also got that altitude condition to step into the touchdown controller. So the additional checks are in the form of you know wings level and keep that tail boom up. And currently there is no forward position being used. So um, and given the fact we haven't got an airspeed indicator as well, in high wind conditions, if we're asking for a zero velocity touchdown, uh, we might find in the touchdown, the vehicle might tend to drift aft very slightly. So with all that said and done, um, back in real flight eight, this is what that controller looks like. So another video will start very shortly, um, which will go through the whole autonomous auto rotation. So our aircraft is flying along in straight level unaccelerated flight. The auto rotation is initiated. 
the aircraft's nose drops to maintain that airspeed. And you can see there's a little bit of wallowing there, so it could be tuned a little better. In the glide, we're evaluating when to flare. There's the flare raising the nose, entering into the touchdown to land. So from what I can see in the simulator, um, the, the way the controllers are laid out at the moment is looking very promising. Um, it's still to be seen whether we have the acid test of reality, because that is a far noisier environment, uh, whereby there are significant um, uh, accelerations and vibrations that uh, we're going to need to filter. So that's going to be basically the first thing I need to do next is um, I need to improve the filtering uh, in the auto rotation library. Um, I'm not going to do anything fancy with that. All the, the brilliant work um, has already been done with um, all the filters that are available. So I'm just essentially going to apply those in the auto rotation library uh, to try and clean up that data. Um, then um, this work again has already been started. There is already a PR for bringing airspeed indicators into RGCopter. This is a criticality that I need to introduce before uh, going and doing real world testing. So um, that's something that's on my list to get sorted. Then it's moving into the real world testing. So this is when we start to find out, is this actually gonna work? So, um, and as I do that, I'm gonna keep uh, some you know, diligent notes so that I can develop a sensible tuning guide. Um, so then once that's all working, then we start to add in some of the, the fancy cool features. And this is where we're gonna look at some autonomous navigation options. So um, some of those uh, options are going to be things, or some of the ideas are um, sort of hijacking the sort of re, um, the relay waypoints or the relay points so that operators can define a number of areas in their operating area and say, hey, look, I think this is a sensible landing area for an emergency landing. So that if the autonomous auto rotation is initiated, the vehicle will do its best to maneuver towards one of those suitable landing areas. Um, something else as well is that if we introduce airspeed indicators into RGCopter, um, there is the point that eventually we might be able to start getting sensible wind estimations as well. With suitable wind estimations, that means we can add the navigation option to simply get the aircraft to turn into wind when it's coming into land. Then I want to do some more sort of building contingency against those what if scenarios. So this is dealing with an emergency condition. Um, essentially, you know, if something has gone wrong to initiate an autonomous auto rotation, it's very likely that something else is going to go wrong. So I've already done a little bit of this with kind of handling poor uh, RPM sensor health. So I want to go through some more of those contingencies to try and um, uh, do the best job I possibly can to get the aircraft in down in as many, or sorry, as few pieces as possible. So then there's actually adding that uh, auto power failure detection. Now, I, a lot of people have already started talking about using um, sort of motor telemetry a lot more. And that's essentially what I want to do is basically monitoring uh, motor RPM versus the expected uh, throttle uh, request. And any sort of significant deficit in those can instigate an auto power failure detection. Uh, I want to add more auto testing features. Um, so I'm going to be pestering Peter Barker a lot more about this for some hints and tips on um, how to prevent this code from rotting. Um, and then there's the adaptation for non-rigid rotor heads. There's another point which I haven't actually included in this presentation is um, I also want to uh, add support for the auto rotation to still have your control for uh, direct drive variable pitch tail rotors. Uh, so that's also on my list of things to do. And I've started working on a test platform for that. So this brings me uh, to the end of my presentation. So just to summarize, I've given an overview of auto rotations. So hopefully uh, for those of you that weren't already aware of it, um, you'll have a little bit of a better idea of what they are and why we care about them and how they work. Um, I've explained sort of like a, the, my development process, what I've done, um, what controllers I've got so far, um, and a little bit about kind of the, uh, the, the look forward and the decision making in the logic behind the controller. Uh, I've shown you some of the results I've had in the sim, and I'm quite eager to carry on, and um, particularly to get out and to do some real world testing. So as soon as I'm allowed to go back outside and do some flying, I'm hoping to be able to do so soon. Um, so at the end of my presentation, I just want to make a couple of thanks. So, I mean, a huge thank you to the RG Pilot community. I mean, like, uh, it's, a, it's a great community to be a part of and the, the support for this project has been brilliant. Um, so I also want to say thanks to Steve Zietz and Terraplane because they've also provided a, a lot of support, sort of some financial aid for um, uh, giving me a test platform to actually go out and do this in the real world. 
Um, and finally, I just want to say a huge thank you to Bill Geyer, who has been my mentor through the Google Summer of Code project um, and you know, continuing onwards. So uh, it's a pleasure to work with Bill and uh, I look forward to working with him in the future and on other projects. So I welcome any questions. That's absolutely brilliant. Thanks so much, Matt. It's a really, really great talk. Um, so there was a few uh, comments in the group chat there. I'm not sure if you saw it while you were showing your slides. Uh, not yet. Mm. Uh, so the first one, Tom was asking about the sensitivity to altitude estimation above the ground. Okay. Um, sort of, does it really require LIDAR? Or, yes, yeah. Um, um, yeah, so th this is going to be a significant problem um, that I think we've been aware of from the beginning is that um, uh, essentially I think it's going to be downward facing. LIDAR is going to be a minimum for this to work well. Um, because uh, as I understand, you know, the, the, the offset from, or the EKF offset from home tends to sort of drift quite significantly through uh, quite a longer uh, flight missions. So uh, we're going to need something reliable to um, correct that as we get towards the, um, uh, towards the ground, certainly. Yeah, as Randy mentioned, flow for altitude might be a good choice because it'll work at quite high altitude. So it yeah. might work throughout the maneuver. It's yeah. also quite, um, small, quite small as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A little hair flow on the bottom could actually be a, quite a good choice. Super, yeah. I mean, I, I'm keen to try anything. So any ideas I am um, keen to hear. Yeah, this is Bill. The, the other option or the other issue with that is that when you're flying and you lose your, um, lose your uh, motor, uh, you don't know where you're going to be landing to, so it's really important to know that altitude. And so that's why I'm not sure that terrain would be able to give you an accurate enough estimate of how high the the, the terrain is. But uh, you know, it's good. It's definitely going to need a, a lidar or some sort of a more precise altitude measurement. We recently added the slope of the terrain data to the lidar data for plane landings. So if you're landing on a slope, it doesn't use the absolute terrain, but uses the slope to forward predict what the LIDAR will be at your landing point. You could possibly do something similar. Okay, sounds good. I will certainly look into that. So Paul's got his hand up, Paul. Yep, yep. I'm sorry, I just forgot to hit the unmute button. As I was just typing into the comments, so a couple of things that would be worth looking at given the, the need to better know the, the wind drift or, or the forward airspeed. Um, something we did on, uh, I did on PX4 ECL was introduce fusion of uh, specific forces in the X and Y, or in other words, the two axes uh, perpendicular to the, you know, the rotational axes of the rotors. And those specific forces are related to the, the drag and, and can be used if you know the ballistic coefficient of the body in those two directions to give you a, a rough airspeed estimate, which is better than nothing at all. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be, it'd be good if I could have a chat to you um, uh, another time, Paul, just to sort of understand that a little bit better, um, because th th that sounds like it would be uh, um, something that'd be great to add. Yeah. You, given a heli rotor when you're flying forward is a bit like a wing, can you do similar things with, like you can with a, a wing to estimate your airspeed from your turn rate? Um, the, the difficulty, in principle, yes, you can. Um, the difficulty we have is that the more we go down that route, the more difficult it becomes to um, step back and allow for um, non-rigid rotor head types. So if we go for, so if, when people want to use teetering rotor heads or fully articulated, uh, there's a significant phase difference between um, the control input and um, your, your, the, the, way, the way your control vector is generated um, versus uh, a rigid head. And so you, that sort of approximation uh, will start to break down. So I would, it, it, would be, it, it would be a good start, but I'd be hesitant to take too many assumptions down that route purely because it means it's more work we have to uh, unwrap to then um, make it more generic. So we've got a, a question from Ken there. Okay. I mean, uh, two questions actually. Um, what about landing uh, 180 degrees backwards for, uh, to reduce the tail strike potential. 
And uh, what about ground effect coming into play just when you're about to land? Do you compensate for that or is it a natural benefit um, to when you, when you need that critical last bit of thrust? Okay, uh, good questions. So um, a 180 uh, degree autorotation, yeah, is, is perfectly doable. Um, however, the, the difficulty you have there is that you're in, in your sort of uh, velocity height diagram. So this is what's typically used for helicopters to tell you where is a safe operating speed that will allow you to still autorotate. Um, typically, you're going to be operating with forward airspeed. Um, so <laughs> what that means is to be able to then uh, reverse the direction of the vehicle, you're going to have to input some significant yaw. Um, which is ultimately just going to take energy out of your head. You have a limited amount of energy to get down. So um, given that um, the uh, amount of, I mean, 3D capable helicopters can definitely do it. But when you start looking at the higher disc loading vehicles uh, with UAV applications that are much heavier, um, it starts to become a little bit unfeasible to be able to actually do that whereby in the code we can just sort of impose some angle limits uh, as the vehicle approaches the ground and it, that that's, should be sufficient to reduce the likelihood of a uh, tail strike. Um, then with regards to the, the ground effect, the ground effect definitely does come in here. Um, I don't compensate for it, um, but I believe it should just be a natural compensation that will, will help to um, uh, reduce or cushion the aircraft as it comes into landing but th that's really where the real world testing is going to um, to, to show uh, significant information there so I don't know how my hand but I'm gonna go ahead and chime in for here for a second um, I guess one question for you um, Matt is so how, how much have you thought about uh, how this is going to apply to varying uh, weights of helicopters? Because obviously as we get heavier, uh, auto rotation becomes a little bit more challenging, maintaining uh, additional uh, rotors, maintaining your, your rotor energy. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, throughout the entirety of the project, I have, um, I've always been checking in on that. So, um, Again, it is in the sim, uh, but it's a start. So I, I have a number of different models where with varying disc loadings. Um, and every time I do a development, I test the vehicle um, or each of those different vehicles against that. Um, so I've always been you know, keeping in mind that um, there is a wide range of use cases out there. So I have been trying to keep track of that. And your current imp implementation is showing good results with the heavier Disc loadings? Uh, yeah, actually, um, the current implementations show better results for the heavier disc loading. Um, the higher disc loading, um, it, because of the increased inertia, or sorry, I should say the increased momentum of the vehicle, um, as you go into that flare phase, the, um, the, the velocity vector shifts um, a lot quicker. Um, and so you can actually have a much gentler flare, uh, is the, um, uh, the, the, the result. Um, and um, uh, it, it, like, it, like again, it, it is in the sim, but the results from that are um, really nice flares at the moment. Whereas you need a slightly more aggressive um, uh, attitude or angle uh, target with the, the lighter disc loading vehicles. Brilliant. So if there's no more questions, then I'd just like everyone to uh, to thank Matt for his talk. That was really fantastic. Thank you very much, Matt. Awesome, thank you. Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you. So good. Fantastic. I have a question. Um, now... Sorry, just thought of one. Yeah, oh, sorry, uh, what happens with the yep. uh, tail rotor authority during the um, auto rotation phase? Could you have faster descent um, by going into auto rotation and then come out of it? Is that something feasible? Uh, sorry, can you can you rephrase that? I don't fully understand the question. So you're when you're descending and your mm -hmm. um, your tail rotor authority is critical to. I'm trying to think how to phrase this. Can you descend at a faster rate in auto rotation and, uh, and maintain control than actually through a, a powered situation? Um. Sorry, I still don't fully understand. Um, I mean, 
So one of the nice things about the, um, the auto rotation is that when you remove the torque that's applied by the engine, you actually don't need a, um, uh, any tail uh, to be able to provide um, control, strictly speaking. So, you know, in a tail uh, rotor failure, you can do an auto rotation to, to land. So the actual requirement for uh, your authority reduces uh, when you go into the auto rotation case. Um, and that's kind of my point. I, mean, I haven't really thought about how to phrase this question, but yeah, when you're descending under power um, and you're, you're looking for um, thrust, you can slow your rotor head down and then you, your loss of tail rotor authority comes into effect. Is, is there a way to use auto rotation to mitigate that or to? Um, I'm, I'm not quite aware of the, um, that, that reduced, um, uh, sort of authority um, that you're referring to in in, in your um, as you come into land, um, but I mean it's certainly I mean it's it's um, the you know once it's there I mean like the the auto rotation feature um, I mean I think you'd be a pretty brave pilot to um, uh, just um, willingly select to do the auto rotations you know as a standard landing approach, but um, it would um, you know it, it would be there you can do it if you want. Okay.